Historically, the education system in England was a very male-dominated affair. Many schools didn't even have toilet provision for females, the same as how battleships didn't have facilities for females. Women weren't required to fight and die for their country, and so were not catered for on warships. In a similar way, women weren't required to learn professions and to support their families, and so universities were not as open to them as for men. The BBC website has a helpful little game that shows the limited options that women had in the early 1900s. Doors were closed to women. Women couldn't vote, they couldn't study at university, they were not free to get divorces, etc, etc. When looking back in history, we see how women were denied choice and opportunity, but not how men were denied the same. We see how Julie didn't get to go to university in 1917, but not how John didn't get to live. A battlefield swept by machine gun fire, devastated by shelling. Education in England was, until 1891, entirely fee-paying, and it wasn't until 1902 that schools were funded through taxation, rather than by parents. What this meant was that higher education was a seriously expensive business. If a family had a son and a daughter, and couldn't afford to send both to school, and then perhaps on to university, which one should they send? The boy, who'd be obligated to contribute to family income and go on after study to work and support his own family? Or the girl, who'd be obligated to bear children and be out of the workforce? Male sons, in terms of Western societies, are the ones who have got the money. So they're the ones who are going to look after the parents. Very so important. in terms of so when you're having children, you yeah. want male children because they're, they're the ones looking after you. But feminism presents a falsehood that education in the past was denied to women simply because they were women. The obligations that men had to support families are always ignored. This false injustice of the past has led to extreme favouritism for women in education today. The majority of women who study a profession in the UK are not still working full-time in that profession five years or more after graduation. In contrast, the vast majority of men are still working in their trained profession. This is the main reason, for example, that there's a shortage of doctors in the UK. Due to affirmative action for women in university placement, more women than men study medicine, taking up the limited available places on university medical courses. When these women then choose family over career in their late 20s and early 30s, they either quit medicine altogether or work part-time indefinitely then we all suffer for lack of doctors. At the same time, these women claim sex discrimination as the reason why more women don't achieve the most senior positions in hospitals. It might be a long one, so I'd uh, let your nanny know. <laughs> this isn't fair. But if you don't want it, he's got a queue waiting. And they're all men. In spite of the well-established pattern of women quitting work to raise children, we have continuing affirmative action programs to encourage more females into medicine, as well as architecture and dentistry, the sciences and computing. Maybe an urban myth, but the female American architect that designed the Peckham Estate is rumoured to have committed suicide when she saw what it had become. Huge numbers of female students, particularly in the USA, use universities as finishing schools where they seek out the most promising men to be their future husbands. These women are not there to study for a future career, they have no intention of working for a living. They're there to snare a husband, and when they do, they'll often quit university before graduation, or else never do a day's work in their field of study. In this particular instance, you do not deserve to be thanked. Because a man or woman is married. You haven't worked a day so since you got out of college. You've never held a job. Recently, I looked into doing a master's degree in computing. I came across more about how universities are helping women into computer science than I did about the courses themselves. At UCL, a London university, they say this. But why do they aim for an even balance of male and female students? The vast majority of women simply don't have the brains to do computer work. They certainly have intellect, just not technical intellect. And just as importantly, they don't have the desire to do technical work. It's that simple. I'm going to put you in IT, because you said on your CV you have a lot of experience with computers. <laughs> I did say that on my CV, yes. You know this from all of your female friends and colleagues. Most women avoid technical matters like the plague. Can you send someone to fix the printer? It's jammed. Thanks. Bye. From hi-fi systems to computers to car trouble, if it's electronic or mechanical and it doesn't vibrate, women don't want to know. In the men's 100 metres, black men are the fastest in the world and white men don't do anything like as well. For example, there were no white men in the 2008 Olympic final. 
Is this happening because white men are discriminated against in athletics? Are white sprinters oppressed? Or are certain black men simply faster than the rest? If we decide that not enough white men are winning races, what can we do about it? Do we limit the number of blacks that can compete? Do we offer special coaching and funding to white athletes only? Perhaps we should make black athletes wear rucksacks full of rocks. Of course you can't discriminate against black athletes in this way. That's racism, right? And here's where we meet the classic problem afflicting our society in the feminist age. The confusion between equality of opportunity and equality of outcome. In a 100 meters race, all you can do is ensure that everyone starts at the same time, at the same place, and covers the same distance. You cannot control who wins, unless you start fixing the results. And this is precisely what's happening in British education. Universities choose to see it as discrimination that women are not studying computer science. And in order to alleviate this perceived discrimination against women, they proceed to commit actual discrimination against men. Let's say a computer science course has 100 places, 200 men apply for the course, and 50 women. If a university like UCL aims to have equal numbers of men and women on the course, then you can see the inevitable result. 100% of the women may be accommodated, but only 25% of the men. This the university sees as equality. It would actually be fairer to all applicants if the course ended up with 80 men and 20 women. That's 40% each. But this the university sees as discrimination against women. In fact, if the places were assigned based on technical aptitude rather than unfair quotas, then the course would generally end up with over 95% men. That's not sexism, that's realism. By aiming to have equal numbers of women on courses that simply don't appeal to them and that they aren't any good at, you don't achieve equality. What you achieve instead is discrimination against men, lower educational standards to get these women on the courses in the first place, and a shortage of high quality professional workers in those fields when women quit five years into their careers to have children. Everybody loses except for a growing group of women with mediocre technical abilities.